And he said, listen, a plane just went into the World Trade Center. They're calling all everybody in. We got in about a quarter after nine, just about a little bit before the second plane came in. G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are talking with Mitchell Stern, a paramedic who received PTSD as a result of 9-11. Mitchell joined the EMS in 1974 and went on to have a decorated career in the paramedic field. Prior to 9-11, Mitchell was involved in responding to the 1990 Happy Land fire and many other well-known New York accidents. When the World Trade Center collapsed on September 11, 2001, Mitchell was assisting in an ambulance which was partially crushed by the wreckage. PTSD has been with Mitchell ever since that day, and in this episode, he explains now how he lives with it. He also goes into vivid detail of his 9-11 experience and situations from his career. Hello, Mitchell, and welcome to Wellbeing. I got involved when I became an EMT in 1974 and a paramedic in 1977. In 1977, I had a kid before there was ever PTSD or anything. I came across a kid that the car was on fire in an expressway accident, and he was trying to get the people out, and they actually burned alive. He was so distraught. I took him to Bay Ridge Ambulance Quarters, and I made him call his mother, and I sat with him for an hour, and the kid did very, very well. And then I was at the Happy Land Social Club. There were 88 people that were that died of smoke inhalation. It was a club in the Bronx, and they were all dancing, and the guy got mad about his girlfriend. He set the stairs on fire, and there was no other way out. I was the only EMS person that went inside the building with the fireside and pronounced all 88 dead. And then they wanted a way how to, how to show them to the families. So I said, break through the wall, which went into the body shop next door. We put them all in body bags. EMS members will clean up their faces because they all had soot and smoke inhalation and then take pictures of them and then bring them all to the school and let the, the families identify them. And that's how they did it. I mean, it was four to four people. You couldn't step without stepping on a body. Over my career, I've delivered 37 babies. I worked in the worst neighborhoods of the city in the 70s and 80s. I was the first paramedic unit down in Coney Island area. I was at 9-11 where I broke my neck and I wound up getting cancer of the gallbladder. I suffer from PTSD. I know when Florida had Surf City, when the building collapsed, it brought back a lot of memories. In my career, I've seen everything. Uh, I got stabbed with a screwdriver. Um, I worked in the worst of worst neighborhoods you've ever believed. Uh, I became a, a lieutenant in 86 and a captain in 96. I was the commanding officer of the of 900 people that was made up the EMS dispatch operations. To this day, I'm 63. I do miss the job terribly. A good save always made your day. You know, or a pulmonary edema that you were able to give morphine and Lasix and they would come out brand new. Or an overdose, it was really good. But we've had some bad calls over the years. I had a four-year-old girl that had a septal wall defect and she went into cardiac arrest. And I carried her out to the ambulance doing CPR. So those are some of the things I re I remember. But there's a whole host of things that, that haunt you for the rest of your life. you got to be a certain type of person to do this type of job. For us trauma junkies, it was great. It was a high that was better than any drug. 9-11 rocked my boat. I've seen everything. I've climbed on the train. I dove into the Prospect Park Lake for a guy. At 9-11, my chief Gancy got decapitated by some of the fuselage that fell down. Okay. And Commissioner Feehan, uh, another part of the building, or I don't know if it was a fuselage, fell on top of a car. And the gas shot out, and he burnt alive. So I remember like it was yesterday. Did it begin like any other morning, September 11th? It was gorgeous. It was a Tuesday, and it was beautiful. And 
I got a phone call from my aide. I had an aide, and he said, listen, a plane just went into the World Trade Center. They're calling all everybody in. So he met me by the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. We got in about a quarter after nine. And it was just about a little bit before the second plane came in. And it was just pandemonium. We were covered in like Christmas trees and snow. And we were inhaling our face. It's like throwing lines of cement in your face. You know, you were breathing in the stuff and it was choking you up. And we were wearing our shirts or trying to cover our faces. It got real bad. At one point, I was in charge of the treatment sector, and they brought out a burn victim. And the guys there were pretty scared, so I went in the ambulance with them, and I was trying to intubate her. And by that time, the North Tower collapsed. And part of it, we were about 900 meters north of the North Tower. And a part of the building hit the ambulance on the roof. And it collapsed the roof enough that my helmet was on, but it compressed my spine and gave me a linear fracture. But after several hours, because it rocked the ambulance, we couldn't get out. So some firemen, after things calmed down, we, was, we were giving each other oxygen that we had on the on the ambulance. We had these cylinders, we had an H cylinder, so we had enough to pass around. And then they knocked on the back door and they pried us out. And we went to the back of the American Express building. We R and R'd, and then I went on the pile, and we started handing the buckets of debris down. It was so hot, my my shoes melted. After 9/11, I went home, and my wife. After three days, I stayed there. And when I went home, my wife said I was slurring my speech. So I went to the hospital, and they admitted me. And uh, about a few days later, I had surgery on my neck. What was kind of going through your mind when it was coming down? We were in the ambulance when the North Tower fell. That was the first tower. And we heard like a freight train. And we knew something bad was happening, but we just said to hold on. And after we got out, the South Tower had come down. And it just looked like four stories of rubble. Did anything affect you prior to 9-11? Like, did you ever have... PTSD prior to 9-11, or was it really 9-11 that, like, set it off? I think I had it brewing in me, but when you're, you see, there's, there's a machoism in, in New York City. Cops are like, you know, they'll, they'll protect your life. Fire department will, will, will um, preserve your life or rescue. EMS is the only one that will really save you. And the amount of jobs I used to buff, I used to buff jobs everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get on the scene, you do your 10-second survey, which is your safety first, and then you go take care of business. And I was a great clinician and a great diagnostician, and every medical call I see, pulmonary embolism, I saw a guy in VTAC that went into VFib, but we shot him, and we got him back to life. I mean, we saw we had a guy named David Dinkins that was hit with a machete. Three quarters of his aorta was split, and we saved the guy. Wherever there was something going on, I was there. I wasn't afraid of anything. I've never been. Um, 9-11, no, I still I, I sleep at the, uh, I take Ambien to sleep at night and, and uh, melatonin. I have these terrible dreams. I see a therapist for the last 17 years. And out of 9-11, I got cancer of the gallbladder. I had a polyp, and they took out my gallbladder. I had constant sinusitis, rhinitis, my deviated septum, and I got scabs, and it's hard to breathe. I'm on several nose uh, sprays and uh, ear. I think when the pressure came from the building dropping, it popped my eardrum. So I take eardrops. Um, I got uh, barrett esophagus. I got gastritis, duodenitis, and I'm on a pill right now. My doctor gave me yesterday, hoping that I don't have pancreatitis. You're listening to Wellbeing a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Mitchell Stern, a paramedic who has PTSD as a result of the 9-11 attacks. What becomes harder to do in daily life when you do have PTSD? 
you know something? Uh, it's really, I speak to my therapist. The fire department has a counseling unit now, and I've been going for 17 years, and I speak to my therapist about my dreams and about if I see a show and, like, it bothers me and I wake up sweating or I, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking that I'm not sleeping. I go through a lot of that, even to this day. And it's 20 to 21 years ago. Mm. I always have something. If I see an ambulance somewhere, it's like my nose goes up. I got to go see what's going on. Mm. I keep a medical gear in my trunk just in case. But but 9-11 was so overwhelming. It, it, it got to your core strength of, of your ability to live. I mean, I've thought of suicide many times. Sometimes I think, you know, you're laying in bed, you wonder, you know, did, mm. you, did you fulfill your mission in life? That's what you ask yourself sometimes. A lot of guys do. I belong to a group of guys, a PTSD group. We talk about jobs, mm. you know, mm. that, you know, that, that, that still sit in your head. You know, like the other night, they had that kid on, on Chicago Med that drowned in the pool. They got him out, and they got his heart started. And in the ambulance, he went into a secondary cardiac arrest. And I had a job just like that. You know, we had a lot of drowning, kids falling in pools. I, 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 I mean, I've had thousands and thousands of calls in 30 years. And I'll tell you something else. I used to make 37000 as a medic. And I made 92000 one year. And me, a cop and a fireman made the newspaper because they wanted to know why we made so much money. Why did the city not cut us off? But I worked doubles. I used to take late jobs. I, I lived for it. I moved out of my house when I was 17. I had a monster father that was terrible. Mm. He was with the Gambino family, okay. and he used to beat me and my brother when we were kids. So I moved out at 17. So I was working all along. I got hired at 17 on March 24th, and I turned 18 June 12th. I was the youngest guy ever hired to EMS. I worked through AIDS epidemic. Mm. And back when I was on the ambulance, we didn't have the PPE that they have today, the gloves, the gowns, the face masks. We didn't have that. The more blood you got on you, the better job you had. I had a guy one time that was held up in his drugstore or his uh, bodega, and he got shot in the cheek. And I didn't understand why this guy was in cardiac arrest. So we worked him up. We started two IVs. We got him to the hospital. And every week we would have continuing medical education with the doc. And he told us that this guy's bullet during the autopsy crossed his over to his mouth and hit the internal jugular vein and the carotid. And he bled into the supraclavicular area. That's where your shoulder blade is. Right underneath there, there's a little, if you put your fingers by your, by your shoulder blade and touch the bone, the humerus, that's where he bled into. And I couldn't mm -hmm. figure it out for the life of me. I thought maybe the bullet transposed into his chest, you know. But today, there is so much more new equipment. I mean, the ambulances got sonograms, so I can look in your belly and see if you got fluid in there. I mean, we have 12 lead EKGs. We have back blind time. There was only three leads. And if you want to get a different reading, you'd have to move one of the leads over so you could see the EKG in a different light and see if you can diagnose what they call a STEMI, which is a heart attack. But now with the 12 lead EKG, and we have also um, transproteinase inhibitor, which block, you know, it, it, it will get rid of a clot. So if I diagnose you with chest pain and sweatiness, and I see that you have a, a clot in your left ascending uh, aorta or your left ascending cardio coronary artery, I can give you, you know, TPA, and I can save your life because I can bust up the clot. But of course, you got to be careful, and you know, because they can get a stroke on that. People that that I've had strokes that. People that had atrial fibrillation, you know, it's where your heart beats erratically, the, the atrium, the ventricles, they, they um, beat very, very regularly. And because the atrium fibrillates, 
it allows blood to coagulate. And then if you get a good party, it pushes those clots right into your brain and you have a stroke. So we have a stroke protocol. We give dexamethasone, which shrinks the uh, the cranial, uh, dilates the cranial brain, uh, arteries. We put ice bags all around his head because the colder the brain is, the more you can save it. I've okay. had th- hundreds of, of saves because I knew my medicine. I have a master's in pathophysiology from Harvard University. I have a bachelor's in physics, and I went to the Albert Einstein School of Medicine for my paramedic degree. So I'm very well, well, well versed in medicine. When you could bring a person back from the devil or from 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 the sickle, you feel it, it's a high, John. That you you can't. I mean, I smoked a little pot when I was younger. I dabbled in this and that, but there's nothing higher than saving a human life, getting a blood pressure back, and then a pump, and then you give them dopamine, and you're getting a regular mm-hmm. blood pressure back, and then maybe they open their eyes, and you know. But sometimes you get a vegetable, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. You're only yep. saving them for their organs. Was um, mental health ever talked about in the paramedic field? Mental health did not come in until about, let's see, I became a lieutenant in 86. Right before 86, about 84, they created a peer pressure where there were EMS members that got training in PTSD, peer support, um, bad calls, how to deal with them, how to deal with the employee, you know, what to say, what not to say. And then came the fire department version, which is great. There's a counseling unit in every borough in New York. Mm-hmm. After the third day when I came home, what happened was we had a lot of influx of all these volunteers from around the country, but they weren't professionals. And if they heard a creak or a crack or maybe the buildings were settling, they ran off like a stampede. So I got caught up in it. And I rolled down four stories of, of garbage. I lost my glasses. I twisted my ankle. And that was the third day. I said, I'm going to go home. I, I did my share. So at that time, I went home. And my wife says, you know, you're slurring your speech. You look terrible. I, I still have my uniform all wrapped up in a box. And it looks like somebody just took lime cement and just mm. kept tossing it on you. Mm. Did you realize within in, within yourself the impact that nine eleven had on you at the time, or did it kind of did it take some time for you to kind of realize just how much of an impact mentally it had on you? It took a while. I mean, you were so involved in it. You knew you had treatment sectors. You know that we were bringing people to Chelsea Pier. Um, I am an expert in disaster management. When Katrina hit Louisiana, I wrote a piece for CNN called Dissection of a Disaster. And I also got my training from the Fire Academy in Maryland. So I've taken every course in disaster management. I've written a whole... I would say not a book, but a pamphlet, you know, which is about 30 pages. You know, we're in a, in, in a closed environment. People don't tell us they've got AIDS, they've got herpes, they've got any communicable disease. They're embarrassed. So mm-hmm. you're working with them. You're starting IVs. You know, I stuck myself with a needle once, and I got herpes simplex one. And that's a lifetime, yep. you know, yep. but I don't get... I don't get the sores anymore or anything. I think it just sits in your spine, you know, until you get so stressed out that it brings it out. But I like watching the top shows, the the fire department shows. I get a thrill from them. Because if you ever watch Chicago Fire, it is basically just what happens in New York. It's the closest thing show in New York. But yes, PTSD is with me every single day. And I know I'm going to heaven. I saved a lot of life. A lot. Did you find it hard to talk about your PTSD? Like when you first kind of came on? I cried. I cried sometimes to myself. There were times that I got such an low that I was upset when my friends died or a call that really didn't go good. And I always used to go to CME to see if my diagnoses were correct. I wanted to be, my theory was they second to none. When, so when did you get diagnosed? With what, PTSD? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
to two months after the incident. I saw a psychiatrist. I saw several psychiatrists. I'm on right now Lexapro, Seroquel, Abilify, Clonazepam, which is anti-anxiety, and I go to sleep at night with clonazepam, Ambien, and melatonin, and my CPAP. And hopefully I'll get a good rest. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Mitchell Stern, a paramedic who has PTSD as a result of the 9-11 attacks. Did you find it at first hard to admit to yourself that you had PTSD, or like, what was the story there? No. I, I, I knew I was depressed at times. I know what depression looks like. I know what it feels like. And when I started feeling it a few months after, I sought out Dr. Ira Drower, and he's now in Israel. But he was great. He walked me through a lot. He said, you know, I'll tell you a little story. Back in the 80s, when I was, uh, early 80s, when I was on the ambulance, I had a partner named Mark Michael. He was a Jewish kid, and his parents wanted him to be a doctor. So he went to take the MCAT, and he failed. Well, the next day, he called me that night, and I was young. I had smoking pot. I was with a girl. I said, Mark, can I talk to you tomorrow? He said, because I'm off. He said, I really like to talk to you, but I kind of blew him off. The next day, when I went to work, I was with my third partner. There was three on the ambulance. And we got a call that medic, uh, a brown Buick with a Medic 7 license plate has been found with a DOA inside. And my partner killed himself. He shot himself three times in the belly. And he left a note. What I did to myself is completely out of protocol. Um... I'm sorry, EMS, I'm sorry, ESU, and I'm sorry, Flatland. What I wanted to do, I wanted to do, love Mark. I'll never forget the uh, the letter. I rode with him in the back of the ambulance to the morgue, and I shed a lot of tears asking him why did he do it, you know, and then I felt very responsible because he called me, and he called two other people, but they didn't have time for him. You never know how deep somebody's in it, you know, I, until you could actually see them in person. If I say, John, I had a real bad day today. I had two cardiac arrests. I had four shootings. You know, I had a stroke. I had, a, you know, chest pain. You know, everything got fucked up today. Trip going down the stairs with the chair, you know, with a patient's family. Now, that's another thing. When we go to these calls, they're dangerous. When someone's in cardiac arrest, the family is pounding on the walls and screaming. They want you to save that life no matter what. And when you can't, you got to pronounce the person there inside the house. Outside, you take them to the morgue. I got a, I got a city uh, award, employee of the year. I had a mafiosa guy shot three times in the head, three in the chest. And the family was outside screaming at And they were, you know, they wanted to know, you know, they started yelling at, you know, do something, do something. So we did something called the cosmetic job. We knew he was dead. But when we put him in the ambulance, we put him into Bay Ridge Ambulance. They were on the scene. They were a volunteer. And we had a black book. I used to carry a black day timer. And then it was phone numbers for drug addict, for geriatric, for everything. And they put his book back in my jacket. When I went into the medic room, I put my jacket on after he restocked, and I felt this heaviness. So I pulled it out, and I started looking through it. And I found this piece of paper that had some design on the edge. And I opened it up, and it said, Paid the bearer on demand, $1 million. You know what a bearer bond is? Yeah. Yes, I do. I do. Well, I was a millionaire for about an hour, <laughs> <laughs> and then I gave it to the uh, I gave it to the homicide detectives because in the emergency room coordinator's office there were three guys there. I knew they were mobsters, and they were saying, "You want to be a hero? We'll make you a hero." Where's his belonging? He had a diamond ring and necklaces, and we didn't touch nothing. But I had the the document. I mean, theory, if I hit it and they're all dead now, I'd be a millionaire. But that was not me. I never stole a dime from anybody. And I got employee of the year. I met the mayor. I had breakfast. I was one of the good guys. And I was at the Waldorf Astoria with Ronald Reagan. I met him in the morning. There's a picture of my career there, shaking his hand. I met Chancellor Schmidt of Germany. I met Nelson Mandela. I met uh, President Carter. 
there was a lot of dignitaries. And I worked, I got to, uh, you know, I was in the movie The Siege with uh, Benzel Washington and Bruce Willis. Okay. Remember that movie where the, yeah, I'm the guy carrying the woman down the stairs from the exploded uh, theater. Okay. I got my screen acting skill card. <laughs> Did you ever feel like with the PTSD that you wanted to stop having it, but you just couldn't? You can't stop it. You can't. It's always in your mind. If you see something outside, it might be a trigger. If you're just dormant and laying in bed watching TV and something comes on that triggers, there's a lot of trigger modalities. That's what they taught us. And we were supposed to stay away from them if we can and take our medications religiously. What are some things that a family member or a friend can do that can really help someone that has PTSD? Uh, show love, um, show respect, I guess. I mean, to my kids, I'm their hero. I mean, because my mom and my wife would used to ask me about my day, and I would, you know, regurgitate it. And um, to my kids, I'm their hero. And uh, I don't think you ever get rid of it. I think it's something that, that lays it into your brain, you know? And when you see a show that sparks something or triggers, there's a lot of triggering mechanisms. I might see a car from a car accident, but not nothing going on. It's just all banged up and think of one of my car accidents, Mm. you know, that I had. I've been on train derailment. I've been, oh my God, bus crashes, I everything. Anything you could name, I was at one of those scenes. Guy jumped out of the T building, oh, okay. which was the cycle building, landed on the picket fence. We had to cut the picket fence to get him into surgery. From this interview, for the people listening, what would you want them to take home from this, like out of everything here? Like what would be the take home message for them? That this is a very special job that. Not everybody's cut out to do, and it does leave you scarred. No matter who you are, if you're the strongest guy in the world or the weakest guy in the world, when you do a job like this, it ingrains into you some of the things that you've seen throughout your career, or if you happen to be involved in a mass casualty incident, you will never forget it. Never. You can recall these type of things like they happened five minutes ago. It was really good talking with you today, Mitchell. Thank you for really taking the time. Be safe, be healthy, and be blessed. My guest today was Mitchell Stern, a 9-11 survivor and paramedic with a PTSD journey. Tune in next week where we talk with a mother of a daughter who has PTSD. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.